I've long had a tendency for a bit of mild eczema from time to time that was generally fairly minor and had some association with stress. In my uh, meandering studies of nutritional relationships, I came across the work of two American doctors, uh, Brownstein and Fletchus, who they're among a small but growing body of doctors that suspect a general, though mild, iodine deficiency to be responsible for a whole range of ailments. In today's video, I want to explore what happened when I used some topical iodine on my eczema, but I also want to share some of my broader findings in my research on iodine, hoping that it might uh, be of some value to you. So if you're ready, let's go. Here is a shot of the eczema rash I mentioned in my intro. And here is the standard Lugol solution I obtained from my local compounding chemist, which I applied. I simply applied a few drops over the site and smeared them in with the tip of the dropper until the yellow iodine stain absorbed and dried onto the skin. By the end of the first day, all the iodine had absorbed and the yellow was no longer visible. There wasn't much change the second day, so I just reapplied the iodine over the eczema site as on day one. Again, by the end of day two, the iodine had totally absorbed, leaving no trace, and by the third morning, the rash seemed to have faded a little. I kept applying the iodine each morning, and as you can see, by day five, the rash had entirely vanished. I had a few spots of rash on other patches of skin, and repeated the same process and in each case within five or six days the rash vanished entirely and would be gone for months at a time. The only thing I noticed during the application of iodine was that on occasion the area would get a bit itchy and perhaps a bit stingy but not beyond my tolerance. I was surprised to see it go so easily considering that all the dietary things I tried like eliminating dairy gluten and other classic irritants seem to make no difference in my case. So let's talk a little bit about iodine, the current medical stance, and why these particular doctors seem to have some alternative views on it. Iodine was discovered in 1811, and uh, in about the late 1800s, doctors became aware of the relationship between goiter, which is an enlarged thyroid mass in the throat, and a deficiency in iodine. The rise in industrial farming, poverty, soil erosion, all led to deficiency in minerals in the soils that led to an epidemic of goiter across the world, with more severely affected regions showing diminished physical growth, head size um, and IQ to the point of retardation. It was commonly called cretinism in very, very severe cases. The subsequent iodification of salt, flour and milk was the first recorded public health mass supplementation program that had massively positive results, reducing goiter to minimal levels wherever it was introduced. Currently, the World Health Organization estimates that at least two billion people suffer from chronic iodine deficiency, and they further state that iodine deficiency is the leading cause of preventable intellectual and developmental disability in the world. The recommended daily intake of iodine for adults is 150 micrograms. Lactating mothers are advised to take almost double that at 290 micrograms. An upper limit of tolerance is advised to be about 1100 micrograms, although the Japanese eat seaweed which provides them upwards of 3000 micrograms per day. So here is already a point of contention with uh, standard thinking. The largest food source of iodine is seafood, and in particular, wakame seaweed, which is eaten largely in Japan and Korea. It gives approximately 640 micrograms per gram, compared to iodized salt, which gives about 77 micrograms per gram. And uh, milk, for example, gives 99 micrograms per gram, according to the Linus Pauling Institute. Dr. Fletcher says that uh, while this recommendation is adequate for the thyroid needs, it's not adequate for the entire body's need of iodine. 
and uh, he further says that eating seaweed isn't necessarily the best answer because in modern days seaweed tends to absorb a lot of heavy metals and a lot of other toxicity not least of which it's picking up a lot of the radiation from the Fukushima disaster so there needs to be an alternative method of acquiring iodine. In the body iodine acts as an antiviral and an antibacterial because of its effect on the environment that these bacteria and viruses grow in. Um, it also stimulates the immune response which is an additional bonus as, as well as to uh, its effect against parasites. Iodine also has anti-cancer properties in that it stimulates cellular apoptosis which denies the cell the ability to act immortally by dividing forever. It also alkalizes or raises the pH of the blood, uh, which is of interest to anyone looking at alkalizing uh, in their diet. And it's also a mucolytic, and it's been used for well over 100 years to loosen up phlegm in asthma, uh, emphysema, and other kind of respiratory disorders. So let's, let's now have another look at the different types of goiter. And in particular, I'm going to talk about hypertrophy versus hyperplasia. Now, iodine deficiency causes goitre, which is well known, and there are two types. One is hormonally driven and leads to hypertrophy, and the other one is iodine deficiency derived and it leads to hyperplasia. The difference between hypertrophy and hyperplasia is that in hypertrophy, the tissue grows in size, but the total number of cells of that organ remains the same. Whereas in hyperplasia, the number of cells replicate and increase. Now this is important because hyperplasia is much more common in glandular types of tissue. Whereas hypertrophy or hypertrophy is much more common in cells where there are limitations in the ability of that organ to replicate. For example, heart tissue it has a much greater tendency to hypertrophy, whereas um, the liver and the glands of the body, like the thyroid, the testes, the ovaries, um, and breast tissue, has a much greater tendency to hyperplasia. This is particularly of importance in iodine because iodine is stored primarily in the glandular tissues. So uh, concentrations of it are found obviously in the thyroid, but also in the breasts, the ovaries, the testes, the, and the prostate and the pancreas. We also know, however, that, that uh, iodine is also stored in the skin, about 20% of the total body volume, as well as in muscle, approximately 30%. So if we look at um, the skin for an argument's sake, as, as I did, um, what can we say about issues in iodine deficiency in the skin? Well, the salivary, lacrimal and sweat glands also depend heavily on iodine for their production of saliva, tears and sweat. So one of the common signs of deficiency of iodine is dry eyes, dry mouth and dry skin. The giveaway with dry skin is a failure to work up a sweat even when you've been vigorously working out and are red and puffed out. Because iodine deficiency leads to hyperplasia, um, it's been found to relate in an increased incidence of cancers, particularly, again, in glandular tissues such as breast, ovary, thyroid, and possibly even, even testes and prostate, as well as in alimentary cancers such as the stomach and the esophagus. Women tend to have a higher level of thyroid disease than men because estrogen inhibits the uptake of iodine. So when they hit menopause and estrogen levels drop, the thyroid is suddenly stimulated to grow. And one of the effects of that is that it can inhibit thyroid hormone function and lead to a hypothyroid condition. The brain also depends heavily on iodine for mental alertness and activity. So another sign of iodine deficiency is sort of mental fogginess, fatigue and even confusion. Chronic developmental deficiency causes mental retardation and a failure to develop higher centers of intelligence. According to Brownstein and Fletcher, supplementing with iodine not only increases mental activity, but can keep you awake at night. So they definitely recommend any kind of iodine supplementation be given in the morning. They further claim that iodine supplementation in pregnancy 
can clinically raise the IQ of the offspring, whilst the deficiency can lead to neurological deficit and even conditions like ADHD. So Fletcher describes a typical deficiency pattern. If the thyroid is deficient, you get enlargement, cysts, nodules, decreased function. If the breast is deficient, you get cysts, scar tissue, nodules, enlargement, lack of function and pain. If the ovaries are deficient, you get cysts, scar tissue, nodules, enlargement, um, and you get polycystic ovarian syndrome. If it's in the skin, you get cysts, nodules, scar tissue, decreased function, in other words, decreased sweat and elim elimination of toxins. If it's in the muscles, you get cysts, scarring, nodulation, pain, in other words, fibromyalgia. If it's in the brain, you get fogginess, decreased IQ, mental confusion, ADHD. So if governments have already dealt with low iodine by fortifying salt, flour and milk a century ago, why is there supposedly a problem all over again? A lot of it has to do with competing halides. Note that all five elements in the halide column compete in the body for receptor sites and they also displace each other. A century ago, only chloride from salt was in any way available to compete with iodine, but its form is very stable. The presence of other halides was negligible. Of course, our water supply is now fully chlorinated, with industrial chlorine being a neurotoxin, and on top of that, it's also fluorinated, makes, making it extremely difficult for the small doses of iodine that we do get to get into our body and be maintained. On the subject of dietary iodine, nowadays the iodized salt in flour competes with bromides, which are the end product of bakers adding bromates that improve the bonds between gluten and uh, rapidly improve or mature the dough. Bromide, like chlorine, um, actively competes with iodine. Bromides are also found in many medicines, antidepressants, antibiotics, and um, asthma medication in particular as well as in soft drinks, industrial acrylics, pesticides and plastics. That new car smell that we all like, they're fumes from curing plastics that are particularly tainted with bromides. So we have three additional halides, bromine, chlorine and fluorine, that displace their colleague iodine from the body and uh, compete with receptor sites uh, both internally and externally on our bodies. Something that wasn't the case a hundred years ago. The dairy industry used to use iodine in its sterilization processes, but um, in recent decades they replaced that with chlorine, which again makes less iodine coming into the body. As for iodized salt, who eats that anymore? Um, you know, everybody's eating designer salt, uh, whether it's Himalayan or Molden or kosher or some other type of salt that doesn't contain iodine. There are two available forms of iodine, iodine and iodide, iodide being the salt form of iodine. Iodine readily absorbs through cell membranes, while iodide needs to be transported through protein mechanisms. And one of the problems in absorption of iodide is it's very common today because of our lifestyle and our diet to have damage to those iodide symporter mechanisms. Now, Dr. Fletcher notes that one way of repairing those uh, transporter mechanisms is taking a dose of 3000 milligrams per day of vitamin C, adding up to 13 milligrams of iodine and supplementing with vitamins B2 and B3. As I mentioned before, um, the greatest source of iodine traditionally has been seaweed and most Japanese uh, have been estimated to get about 13 milligrams of iodine through seaweed. Supplemental sources of iodine vary on your location, but uh, a really traditional form has been Lugol solution, which contains both forms. Unfortunately, testing for iodine is not very common these days, um, but researchers have developed a urine clearance test where you would consume a given dose of iodine and then collect urine across 24 hours and test for the amount of iodine that's been excreted. The more iodine you excrete, 
the less your body has needed it and allowed it to be excreted. The more deficient you are, the more the body will retain the iodine and the less will come out in the urine. And so they use this as an indicator as to necessity. There was uh, at some point a recommendation to do a, a skin patch test where you would apply some to your forearm and see how many hours it took for it to absorb. The faster it absorbed in your skin, um, the more deficient you were deemed to be. So how do you go about utilizing iodine if, for example, you have Lugol solution? Well, Fletch, us and Brownstein advocate taking drops of iodine, and it's best if you go onto their websites, I'll put them in the links below, for you to look at their protocols on your own. Now, it is important to give a disclaimer here because any form of iodine supplementation can have serious adverse effects. So it's important to discuss any sort of needs that you think you might have um, with your doctor before undergoing any kind of iodine therapy. If you have a rash, for example, in my case, always apply only a little bit to a small circumscribed area just in case you have a reaction to it and monitor it over a couple of days to see how you go. I'd be really interested to see what your results are, especially if you have eczema or any other skin condition. So there you go. It was a, a, an interesting introduction into iodine. It was certainly not something I was expecting and uh, I tried it on my eczema purely out of curiosity and uh, was quite surprised at the results. So hopefully you'll find something interesting yourself if you have any skin condition. If you're looking at fibromyalgia or brain fog or any of the other uh, number of conditions that I mentioned, again, please do talk to your doctor. Don't take it upon yourself to add it to your diet, especially in the doses that um, Brownstein and Fletcher suggest. I'm always for being conservative whenever possible. So if you are interested, please do some more research and again, talk to your doctor and see what they recommend for you. So hopefully you'll get some benefit out of this video. Um, leave your comments in the section below as always. Thank you for viewing my videos. And remember until next time, walk tall. Cheers.